Hello, my name is Kim Eagle from ACC.org, uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. And today we're covering the Friday, uh, August 25th, clinical trials at this year's ESC meeting in Amsterdam. Uh, we've picked four important trials to talk to you about today. And I'm really delighted to be joined by three clinical trial experts. We have Gabrielle Stegg from Paris. We have uh, Pyle Coley from Denver, Colorado. And we have Darren Kambadi, who is from Dallas, Texas. Um, and we're going to start with a trial, which is called COP-AF. And Pyle, give us your thoughts about this trial. Uh, Kim, you know, I've been using colchicine since I was back in medical school, which is longer than I would like to admit. And we've known for some time that colchicine has a lot of anti-inflammatory properties. So the COP-AF trial looked to see whether colchicine could be used in the prevention of atrial fibrillation in patients who were undergoing non-cardiac surgery, but thoroscopic or thoracic surgery. So surgery involving the chest, but non-cardiac surgery. Now we know recently we've had a couple of colchicine trials called Colcott and Lodoco that showed that colchicine also has a benefit in major adverse cardiovascular events in patients with CAD and acute coronary syndrome. So they went ahead and also looked at myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery or MINS as we like to call it. And, you know, they gave colchicine prior to the surgery, so about four hours before, 0.5 milligrams, and then they gave 0.5 milligrams BID for up to 10 days afterwards and followed the patients for 14 days. And the headline here, Kim, is that there was no difference really in postoperative atrial fibrillation that required treatment or caused symptoms or myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery. Now, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater because there were some signals in some subgroups. So the subgroup that had thoroscopic surgery did have a positive effect on some of these outcomes. They also looked at some post hoc analyses that looked to see when you pulled a bunch of outcomes together, were they coming out positive? And perhaps there was a power issue because when you pulled a bunch of outcomes in a post hoc fashion, some of them did appear to be positive. It's not a surprise that colchicine causes diarrhea. So we saw a significant increase in diarrhea in terms of safety signals, but overall the efficacy, at least today, stands negative. So I don't think I'm going to be changing my clinical practice for my patients that are undergoing a thoracic surgery by giving them colchicine quite yet. But I do hope that we'll continue to sort of knock on this door and look at some more trials to see whether there may be some benefit of this anti-inflammatory medication. Thank you very much. I agree with your summary. Uh, maybe not a long enough duration to create the kind of anti-inflammatory effect that might benefit patients, but uh, we clearly uh, need to be using more of this agent in our patients with chronic coronary disease. And I think the FDA just approved the 0.5 dose uh, in our country, which is really the dose that we want to be using. So that uh, should be an advance. Um, let's go to the second trial. It's called, I love, I love how we name trials, don't you? BioFlow DAT. This is a great name. Uh, and Gabrielle, tell us about this trial. Well, it's, you know, there's a, there's a full movement of trying to minimize the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy after PCI to try to minimize bleeding. And there have been many trials in this space. Uh, one of the features of BioFlow DAPT is to ask the question of, can we have such a strategy of shortening the duration of DAPT in very, across various types of stents? And specifically, what was compared in this trial was a biodegradable polymer serolimus eluding stent versus a durable polymer zotorolimus eluding stent. And both arms of the randomization stent was randomized. Both arms uh, received only one month of DAPT and then uh, 11 months of single antiplatelet therapy. And all the patients were selected because they were at high bleeding risk, which is an appropriate population in whom you want to consider shortening the duration of DAPT. And what the authors found, and this is a, a large European trial of almost 2,000 patients, they really found no difference in the efficacy in preventing cardiac death, myocardial infarction, or stent thrombosis, regardless of how you define myocardial infarction. They also found no difference in bleeding uh, across the two, the two types of stents, which I don't think is surprising. Overall, the event rates were rather low, and the results were very good across the two platforms, uh, uh, the two stent platforms in this trial. So it tells us that, yes, it's non-inferior to use one strategy versus the other, 
uh, in patients at high bleeding rates. So, Niram, you're an interventionist. Tell me what you think about this trial. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Gabriel summarized that pretty nicely. Uh, I did a dosing this sort of adds to the available literature on uh, truncating the, the duration of paddy failure therapy, uh, you know, post PCI. I think what was interesting, and, you know, like Onyx 1, um, which, um, you know, had a similar construct, they were all patients with high bleeding risk. I think one thing that was interesting about this study um, was, you know, uh, they also included patients who were on oral anticoagulants at the time of PCI. And historically, including in the most recent uh, 2023 uh, chronic coronary artery disease guidelines, you know, you don't de-escalate antiplatelet therapy post-PCI for at least six months. But in this trial, where a third of the patients uh, were on oral anticoagulants, they actually de-escalated uh, at a month. Um, and so that, I think, is a you know, very different um, paradigm, I think, perhaps for us to be able to stop all antiquated therapy. So the, again, the top line is for uh, antiquated agents in general at one month, uh, you, uh, you know, just go to a single agent. But it was interesting that even in the group that were on oral anticoagulants, they could stop, you know, all agents. So that, I think, was very uh, interesting. Um, I don't know if, Jim, you or if you want to comment on that. That's a great perspective. Uh, and I think, uh, Gabriel, do you think that this trial is going to move your practice to say, you know, in those higher bleeding risk folks, I'm I'm comfortable with one month of that? Well, I think it's one more brick in the wall of evidence. Um, and it's a, it's a nice brick. It complements the uh, recent Matrix trial that the same investigators led, Marco Baljimili and colleagues from Europe. Um, I think the evidence is mounting, and we'll come back to this later, uh, apropos another trial in the same space. But I mean, the evidence is mounting that we should really adjust the duration of and the intensity of antibiotic therapy very carefully in patients with high bleeding risk. It's really a testimony to the advances in stent design and stent profile, and of course, the advances that we have in antibiotic therapies themselves. Let's move to another trial called STEP FPEF. Uh, this is an important study, and Pyle, tell us what you think about this trial. I was really excited to see the results of the STEP, STEP FPEF trial. So this was a trial looking at the obesity phenotype within patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And we know that those two conditions often occur together. In fact, the majority of hep patients do have that obesity phenotype. So the study authors here really asked the question, why don't we target the underlying pathophysiology, the obesity itself in hep and then look at endpoints like the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire, which is a quality of life score, as well as weight, to see if we can improve both of those parameters. And, and so they subselected patients with hep -hef and obesity who actually had functional impairments. So these were people who had, you know, NYHA class two to four. They had low sco scores on their KCCQ questionnaire. They may have had elevated BNPs. They may have had left atrial enlargement. They cherry pick patients who have hep -hef and are limited by their hep -hef and are obese. And what was interesting was that, you know, more than half the patients, 56% were female, and we know hep -hef can occur more commonly in females. The average BMI was about 37, and both the dual primary endpoints, the first one being the Kansas City questionnaire, the second one being the body weight, were statistically significant. So we saw basically about a 10.7% reduction in body weight using GLP-1 receptor agonists. The GLP-1 receptor agonists have been around for some time. We've used them in obesity. So now to apply them in patients with hep -hef and obesity, which is what this trial did, is really a game changer in my opinion. Now, what was interesting to me was there weren't a lot of patients on SGLT2 inhibitors, which we know is another medication that, you know, in patients with diabetes and in patients with hep -hef does improve cardiovascular outcomes. So that was a little bit of a limitation of this particular trial. But I think using this class of medications and hep -pefs is opening the door now to really thinking about an outcomes trial and saying, can we use GLP-1 receptor agonists, which we know result in weight loss, which we know result in, you know, improvement in metabolic parameters in patients with hep -pef who do have some of these other phenotypes. And Kim, the way that I like to sort of think about it is that obesity is really the first domino. If you think about the dominoes that fall, and that domino causes all the other dominoes to fall, whether it's heart failure, hypertension, diabetes, AFib, metabolic syndrome, hyperlipidemia, what have you. 
So by treating the root cause of the problem using these GLP-1 receptor agonists, I think these authors have done some tremendous science here. I agree with you. And, you know, if we, if we lower blood pressure, if we reduce sleep apnea burden, uh, if the metabolic profile improves, we improve heart function. And this trial really offers that window of opportunity. So I'm really very excited about this trial and what it may mean as we go forward. Um, the last trial we want to talk about for today's meeting was a wonderful name called SHARE. Uh, and Gabrielle, tell us about this trial. It's a trial that looks at, again, antiplatelet therapy after PCI. It's a South Korean trial that uh, enrolled almost 1,500 patients and compared three months of DAP followed by P2Y12 monotherapy until 12 months to 12 months of DAP. And all the patients had the same stent. And the trial uh, overall is consistent with prior evidence and showed that an approach of only three months of DAP followed by P2Y12 monotherapy is non-inferior to 12 months of DAP, but the number of events was small, so I don't think it's definitive on its own. Again, nicely complements prior pre-existing evidence to say that this is a reasonable and safe strategy. But maybe, as we'll see later with other trials that was presented at this meeting, we shouldn't push the envelope too far. Got it. Well, the, the, the evidence certainly is accumulating that in high-risk patients, we can definitely shorten the duration and getting more precise with exact amounts, maybe uh, patient specific even, depending on their stent, the rest of their anatomy, et cetera. Well, I want to thank uh, all three of you for sharing your insights on today's trials at the ESC meeting in Amsterdam. This is Kim Eagle for the ACC.org, and we're out. <laughs>